WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is Kathy Fuller sitting in for uh, Robin Frazier and Richard Rothschild on Carol Confidential. It's good to be here today, and I hope everybody's uh, enjoying the last of uh, the good weather that we've been having. Um, I have a guest with me today. Um, Catherine Adelaide is uh, joining me. She is a resident of uh, the Tawny Town area, and she is uh, going to talk with me today about some of the things that are going on in Tawny Town that uh, we think you should be aware of. And uh, if anybody wants to join us, our number here is 410-848-9191. Welcome, Catherine. Are you there? Yes, hi, Kathy. It's Catherine. I'm here. Thank you. Great, great. It's good to talk with you. Um, I know that you've been um, very active in uh, the goings-on of Tawny Town of late, and um, today we're going to focus on one particular issue that's impacting not just your area of Tawny Town, but also my area in Eldersburg, and that is the um, the cannabis issue, medical marijuana issue. Uh, that we're suddenly confronted with in this county. And um, I want to make uh, let our listeners know that uh, in the last couple of years, the legislature passed a medical marijuana bill legalizing medical marijuana in the state of Maryland and uh, set up a commission, I understand, to um, deal with how to go about uh, creating and distributing uh, this new so-called drug. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, oh, it looks like Carroll County is going to be uh, uh, one of those areas where that uh, distribution and perhaps growing, I don't know, will happen. And Catherine has been keeping a close eye on things in Tawny Town for a particular reason. Do you want to fill us in on what's going on in Tawny Town right now, Catherine? Sure. I want to wish everybody uh, a Merry Christmas and this uh, beautiful holiday season, which uh, I personally believe that this uh, drug attack has been uh, orchestrated to fall during the holiday season so that people will be distracted and they won't be paying attention. (laughs) Oh, that is a very common, that's a common ploy of our uh, um, rulers as they as we see them, our, our elected officials seem to look for those times when we might be distractive to go and do all those things that we would otherwise uh, object to if we were able to be paying attention as close. Well, as I'm, I'm with uh, no, I've started uh, with uh, Robin Fraser, No Cannabis in Carroll, and uh, which just really began in Tawny Town uh, when a secret behind the scenes closed meeting occurred, um, which produced a letter from our elected officials, well, three of them, one was absent, Don Frazier was absent, and Joe Bigliotti voted against it, So, but so um, our elected officials uh, sent a letter of approval as, a, as elected officials representing, uh, you know, all the citizens to a, uh, a, a letter of approval for a private business called Cana MD LLC. This is a private uh, for-profit business to uh, a state agency which will be licensing this private business to so me, uh, set up me, shop in Tawny me, Town. Uh, so there's several... this, okay, let me clarify who it is that we're dealing with. So this is the Tawny Town Council and the mayor, Mayor uh, McCarran, is that? Yes. The Tawny yes, Town they, Council the, the, and the mayor got together and did a closed meeting of some sort. Um to support this private business um, to the state. Exactly. They didn't just. They didn't just. Normally, in economic development, a city can certainly, you know, welcome a new business in. But this is not what this was. They actually used the open meetings law, the the exceptions in it, uh, incorrectly and probably illegally, 
to not welcome a new business to Tawny Town, but to actually promote a private business to a state agency, which is going to license them. And this same state agency may have to come back into the city for, you know, a zoning or permit approval. So it's a huge conflict of interest, and uh, it makes people wonder. I had two citizens ask me if there were kickbacks involved, and, you know, it makes people wonder, do they they have a a private interest in this? And it was done. So we just are unearthing uh, maybe a few weeks ago. Citizens are just finding out about it, waking up to this, and they're very angry. Um, And so I started a a grassroots group called No Cannabis in Carroll, and our goal is to push this out of Tawny Town and then to push it out of Carroll County because we do not want our beautiful cornfields to become pot fields. There is a national movement moving from the west to the east like a horde of locusts through every state to force the so-called medical marijuana which really is just the precursor, it's it's phase A of legal marijuana. Legal marijuana in every state has two phases. Uh, Well, it has three. Wait, wait, uh, wait just a second. Before we get into that, because we've got um, an hour to cover this, and I want to make sure that we um, uh, speak, you know, in depth to each point that you bring up. First of all, so this is being advocated by the Tawny Tawny Town government, um, to for this business to locate in the Tawny Town area, and they yes, and it was and, done in secret, so the citizens it, had no knowledge of it whatsoever, and that's what got me going. And coming, when, yes, and coming but, to my uh, attention was that it wasn't just the Tawny Town area that that was done, but uh, now Senator Reedy has also participated in advocating that Carroll County be a location for these businesses. And my understanding is that he sent letters for two uh, businesses, and perhaps this your business in the Tawnytown area was one of them. There was a business uh, that wants to locate in the uh, behind the Home Depot in Eldersburg at the formerly um, London Fog Warehouse. Um, so this is uh, not just a Tawny Town issue, but this is a Carol wide issue because yes, absolutely. And his letter was dated least. September 29th, mm-hmm. and the city's letter was dated September 30th. So uh, you know, all of our uh, not just the local Tawny Town people, but our elected you know, representative um, in the state legislature also did the same, I think, you know, violated the ethics law and probably, I don't know about that with him with an open meetings law, but there's probably ethical violations. Again, the ethics law is very clear when you're a prominent and when you're an elected official, you can't show favor to a business in the licensing process. That's unethical because it it, makes it seems like there would be lots of businesses that might be interested in this to choose one or two in particular to recommend does seem it's, it's right and that's, that's winners. a second ethics mm-hmm. it's a second ethics violation mm-hmm. they can't have an appearance of a conflict of interest there has mm-hmm. to be full disclosure of any financial interest and secondly it's just a plain outright ethics violation to favor any one business but especially during a state agency licensing procedure mm-hmm. this is very Political. It should be political suicide because they're, you know, getting they're just getting into bed with the wrong people, and then you add, you know, quote medical marijuana on top of it, and dollar signs just pop up everywhere. Sure. And, our, and our on example, top of that, the, this is a controversial topic. Were there any town hall meetings held to get the, I, you know, to get the support of the community, an explanation of what is being attempted, any kind of, uh, any kind of public input? Do you want this business in, you know, being promoted in your community? Because Absolutely we, not. There was no. Have, the, the, they were required to open the meeting and then close it if they wanted to do uh, uh, one of the exceptions to the open meetings law, and they didn't do that. So the citizens had no idea what was going on. And the really, not only did that occur, Kathy, but it, once it was brought to light, well, citizens began to come in, and I was one of them, and say, "We heard the rumors going out. The Reedy letter was outed, and we came to say, tell our city, hey, this is going on." around here don't bring it into tawny town mm-hmm. and at that same meeting before we had a chance to speak 
uh, Councilman Zambetti outed the, the closed meeting because people from the Wednesday work session were also saying the same thing, so they figured they better out the meeting. Mm-hmm. So I came to warn them not to do it, and at the same meeting was told that they had already done it and there was pretty much nothing we could do about it. And then... Councilman Fraser immediately called for a vote to rescind this unethical, probably illegal letter that was written. Mm-hmm. And the three that, uh, that signed on to it, that voted for it, uh, Zambetti, Foster, and Lance, all voted for it again. <laughs> they, they, so they, really, our- they really, really support uh, this particular business coming into Tawny Town. Um, and it does make you wonder why. Why this particular business and why this particular um, a type of business when obviously it's a very controversial thing. That would be like um, having a strip tease club come in or something like that. This is not necessarily uh, a business that everybody would find as a healthy um, a pro-community business. Because well, exactly. It really attached. doesn't fit into with the character of our tiny town is known as a historic town. Okay, it has quaint little antique shops. And what they opened the door to was for these guys coming in here and opening up pot shops on our main street. And we have a newspaper called the tiny town record. It says a small town with a big heart. Well, no cannabis in Carroll wants wants to make sure we don't become a small town with a big drug problem, a bigger drug problem than we already have out here with the heroin. That's right. And in in, um, Eldersburg, where they're looking at putting uh, one of these distribution areas, uh, is literally across the street from the high school. And and it backs onto uh, middle school grounds. So uh, it's right between, within, within a spitting distance of, of a high school and a middle school. And our um, middle school is in walking distance of the downtown area. I mean, in our shopping area, it's just so out of character. I mean, people move from the city to the country to quaint little towns to get away from this sort of thing. I mean, just the reputation alone, that's not the most important reason. Really the most important reason, there's, there's moral issues involved with it, but the, uh, for our youth, if this, our city officials, as adults, giving a green light to this, the message that it sends to our youth whose brains are not yet developed, they just see it's okay to smoke pot. They do not see it as, oh, you've got to go get a a, a card from the state agency or it's got to be medicinal. And I think actually the most important point I want to make on this show, and I really just learned about this the other day as I keep learning more and more about this every day, is that there already is FDA-approved synthetic uh, cannabis, mm-hmm. which doctors can prescribe and which come out of a pharmacy to treat all of these, you know, so-called, uh, you know, real reasons for pe- that people need me- medicinal marijuana. But that's not what this is, Kathy. This is this the leaves and the paraphernalia straight out of a, a you know a pot shop. There's no. This is nothing to do with medical at all. It is literally a three-part way to get to legal marijuana, and people are being very deceived by the term medicinal. It is not medicinal. There is no medicinal use to smoking pot. There may be some limited medicinal use to a highly refined THC pill coming out of a pharmacy, which people can or who need it can already get. So um, that, to me, kicks the legs out of this thing. It is nothing more than a sham for legal marijuana. First they do legal medicinal marijuana, then they decriminalize well, paraphernalia, gonna, and then they legalize We're, we're going to talk about that in the next two segments. I have um, uh, Congressman Harris had uh, come to Tawny Town for the business breakfast, and he was asked about that uh, very issue, and uh, we have a – a very good um, section of uh, audio tape that he explains that uh, quite succinctly, and we can talk about that. And uh, that's about uh, five minutes long, so I won't play it in this section, but I'll play it in the next segment uh, that's coming up. And we can talk about what the alternatives are, why this is, um, you know, really not a uh, not a necessary. Thing and uh, that not fortunately not all of our uh, elected representatives are in in on this uh, medical marijuana business. With uh, Tawny Town uh, asking for this to come in, you might think so, but it's not. 
Um, but we've got uh, the end of this segment coming up, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. And we're talking with Catherine Adelaide out of Pawneetown and uh, No Cannabis in Carroll. And we'll be back in a few minutes. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Carol Confidential. This is Kathy Fuller, and I'm sitting in for Robin Frazier and Richard Rothschild today. And I have as a guest Catherine Adelaide, and we're talking about uh, medical marijuana coming uh, to a dispensary near you in Carroll County. Um, welcome, Catherine. Um, I appreciate you being on the show with me today. And I uh, just wanted to kind of bring people up to speed. Uh, Catherine is in the Tawny Town area. Tawny Town uh, City Council uh, uh, sent a letter, unbeknownst to uh, any of its citizens, in support of a particular company coming in, getting licensed, uh, and doing business in Tawny Town to support the medical marijuana industry. Um, and Catherine has taken exception to that. Um, it was done behind closed doors and uh, not done with the um, general knowledge or support of the citizens of Tawny Town. Um, do I have that right, Catherine? Uh, yes, it was um, it was done behind closed doors. Uh, we believe there is uh, no cannabis in Carroll. It's a citizens' grassroots group that is formed from this, and we are actively researching uh, possible ethics violations and Open uh, Meeting Act violations by the city council. They've been asked to withdraw the letter three times and have refused three times, even though we bring this clip that you are doing of Andy Harris. They've heard that. Um, they heard the group come in just last night, and they steadfastly refused to withdraw their letter, even though they said on the record that it means absolutely nothing and has no impact whatsoever. So why did they do it, and why won't they withdraw the letter? That's a very good question, uh, and it makes you wonder what's in it for them, because usually when uh, the politicians stand by something that their constituents really are not uh, enthusiastic about, um, there are reasons behind the scenes that we don't get to see. Um, but I would like to play uh, this five-minute clip from Congressman Harris. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it over the radio. Um, he was asked at a recent uh, business uh, meeting uh, in Tawnytown, the Tawnytown uh I guess, business, business breakfast. Business breakfast, yes. I asked him the question. <laughs> you did. Okay, great, great. And he was very emphatic, and as we all know or should know, uh, Congressman Harris is a longtime uh, doctor, uh, an anesthesiologist, and, uh, and knows quite a lot about this issue. And um, while I respect Congressman Harris, and, and I uh, really thought he did a good job while he was at the state, um, you know, in the, in the uh, Maryland state legislature, I have not always agreed with the stances that he's taken um, at the federal level, but I do agree with him on this, and I would like to play uh, this clip uh, for you and for our audience, and uh, then we can talk a little bit about it. So um, great. here it goes. Let me see if I can get it to come up here. Uh, you know, as a physician, I'm very, very concerned about this, this medical marijuana issue. Because I will tell you, look, I'm an anesthesiologist. My training is to actually take people's pain away, okay? And I was in the state legislature. I sat on the Education, Health, and Environment Committee when, when this first discussion came up. I mean, this has been going on for 10 years, this discussion about medical marijuana. A, uh, one of the leading oncologists from the University of Maryland coming in to testify, my question to him was very specific. Was, How many people in Maryland do you think really – if they were given state-of-the-art non-marijuana therapy, how many people would fail that and need medical or potentially, you know, benefit from medical marijuana? And he said probably a dozen. The problem is not that, that medical marijuana is so great. It's that we have uh, we are not yet giving patients who think they need medical marijuana optimal, best medical therapy 
non non-marijuana therapy. And this is backed up by studies. I mean, if you uh, look up Dr. Rita Volkow and read some of the things she wrote, she heads the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the NIH. And she's looked at the medical marijuana, the medical marijuana medical literature. And look, I, look, I was an I was a NIH funded investigator. I wrote scientific papers. My job was to read and interpret scientific papers. I'm telling you, if you read the medical literature on medical marijuana, it's pardon the expression crappy. There are very few things that it's been clearly shown through well done randomized clinical trials, the gold standard of trials, where medical marijuana is better than conventional therapy. And really it boils down to about one thing. It really boils down to intractable nausea or, in, or a lack, loss of appetite, uh, usually due to either HIV or chemotherapy. Everything else, there is no demonstrated value in the medical literature. It's 180 degrees different from where the FDA would, would license it. What they're doing is they're licensing a new drug. The FDA actually insists that you have rigorous medical studies that show that it's actually useful for specific indications. It's 180 degrees opposite to the way it's done. The reason why it's done this way is because the people who advocate for medical marijuana, the vast majority, not all of them, because some people honestly just don't understand the medical literature. And they have a relative who has a medical problem, and they see that person suffering, and they go, oh, you know, I, I would do anything for this person to end their suffering. And I agree, I'm compassionate, but I think you ought to do what's, what's proven medical therapy. This is not proven medical therapy. The vast majority of people pushing for medical marijuana want recreational marijuana legalized. Period, full stop, that's the way it is. And if you don't believe me, you'll look exactly at what you say. The first thing they do is they, the uh, jurisdiction licenses medical marijuana, then it does decriminalization, then it does legalization. That's the way it goes. The marijuana they grow now, totally different. 10 times more potent, 15 times more potent in terms of the amount of uh, THC, the, the uh, uh, psychoactive component of marijuana. You know, it's, it's not a single uh, chemical, but there's two or three hundred. Two are most important, THC, CBD, uh, which is the one that has potential anti-seizure effects. But you know, the, the fact of the matter is, if you think THC is important for something, and that's the one that actually does the nausea, does, uh, gives you your appetite, is the THC, the CBD anti-seizure effect, then do what we do in every other medicine. You purify it. You don't give the raw plant to smoke. I mean, you know, they're asking, they're going to ask me as a physician, I have a medical license, if I take a course that I prescribe marijuana, what do I prescribe? One to two joints, you know, every four hours as needed? <laughs> you know, I should be writing 500 milligrams of THC every eight hours, you know, as necessary for this symptom. That's not the way that, it's, it's just, you look at this and you go, there, there can only be one goal in mind, it's legalization. Shame on any elected official who looks at this as a revenue obtaining policy. Right. Right. Shame on any official anywhere who looks at this as a revenue gaining policy. We want to legalize something that, 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 are, that actually structurally affects the brain of our children. We send so many bad messages. For instance, when we send the medical, my problem with the, one of the problems with the medical marijuana message is we convert the perception of, medical, of marijuana as something that is bad and, and addiction and, you know, addiction causing, it's performance lowering. We convert it to people thinking of it as a medicine. Now, medicines actually have good connotations. Drugs have bad connotations, you know, illegal drugs have bad connotations. So we've converted to a good connotation. People say, oh, well, we have alcohol. Okay, yeah, alcohol. okay, the horse is out of the barn. Doesn't mean you let all, you know, one horse left, you don't necessarily let all the horses leave. I think this is a real problem. I think this is a real problem on many different levels. Okay, the question is, how does medical marijuana fly under these federal regulations? Uh, we have a Department of Justice that has decided they're not going to enforce federal law. But medical marijuana is illegal. I mean, just realize, under federal law, it's illegal. So that was uh, part of the speech that Congressman Harris gave recently, or a question and answer session uh, that Congressman Harris gave at the Tawny Town Breakfast. And um, being a medical doctor, uh, he has obviously read the literature, and his conclusion is that um, it doesn't do what uh, it says it is purported to do, and there are other methods that we can use to um, ameliorate the conditions of 
most, the vast majority of the people who think that they need it. So well, and also, Kathy, there's, there is FDA-approved synthetic cannabinoids um, that, that are already available for those few cases where they actually need it. And that's the part, the, the whole misnomer of the use of medical marijuana, um, I have a, on the PowerPoint, it says three kinds of, quote, medical marijuana, but really it's such a misnomer to call the, the raw uh, plant medical. Um, that's where people are being deceived because, like he said, you think the average person, when they think medicine, they think an FDA-approved, highly processed, you know, refined THC pill that's being prescribed by a doctor. But that's not what this is. And that's where even when the citizens find out about it, they don't understand what's really coming into their town. So I've coined the term, I am really distinguishing between FDA-approved synthetic cannabinoids and that's the true medical marijuana. This other stuff that they're calling, they call marijuana medicines that states legalize, purely for, for, for profits. When a state violates the federal law of it being a class one illegal drug up there with heroin, when a state legislature does that, your state legislature just became a drug dealer, a state drug dealer, and they're in it for the same reason that the private drug dealers are in it, and that is for the money. And that's why he condemned any political bodies from getting involved with this. I mean, the federal government isn't, hasn't anything vested in calling it a class one drug. I, I was just shocked when I learned that your very serious synthetic heroin and opiates, oxycontin, oxycodone, are class two. Marijuana is in class one, the most dangerous uh, drug up there with heroin, ecstasy, and that sort of thing. I just, I even and, didn't and really know. Of, and what a lot of people don't understand is they look back at their youth, especially people my age and their, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, and they look back on the 60s and they think, you know, marijuana, I tried it in high school or college or whatever, and it was no big problem. Um, now, I, I did not try it, but that's what people who have tried it think. The problem is that the marijuana that's being grown today is not the same marijuana as Congressman uh, Harris alluded to. It's not the same uh, marijuana. It's much more powerful. Uh, it, is, it has been bred to be more powerful, um, and, uh, and that's a large part of the problem. People people have a lot of misunderstanding about what the marijuana is today and what medical means. Uh, right. What, the, the, the word medical is, is the biggest. So I'm really distinguishing when I, and I want the listeners and people to realize that so-called medical is really uh, the raw plant pot leaves for people to smoke. And I do on my PowerPoint, it says today's marijuana is not the marijuana of the 1960s. In the past 15 years, marijuana potency has tripled since 1960. It's grown five times stronger. And without the FDA rigorously, they have not tested or approved the pot plant. And in fact, basically, smoking pot never was, never is not, and never will be medicine. That is drug use, and that is the big con that they're trying to push for. And they'll, they'll sprinkle in a tincture or a pill or two to try to cover themselves. But as Andy Harris said, the entire push is to legalize it for pot smoking. And, and smoking the, pot <laughs> is not medicine. It, it, and, they use anecdotal evidence. They, well, I, I feel bad, and when I smoke pot, I feel better. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, everybody who uses illegal drugs feels better after they use them. That, mm -hmm. That's anecdotal evidence. That's mm -hmm. not double-blind studies by the FDA, which well, they have the medicine, the true medicine for the few people who really need it, is already available. I have, a, I have a statistic here that the average medical marijuana patient is a 32-year-old white male with a history of alcohol and substance abuse, no history of life-threatening illnesses, that 87.9% had tried marijuana before age 19, and 75% uh, of Caucasian patients had used cocaine, and 50% had used methamphetamine in their lifetime. So these are, you know, medical marijuana patients are, are people who are largely already hard drug users. So um, I don't Exactly. Think that's and that's, that's a shocking statistic. 
They like yeah. to paint the well, picture of the child with seizures or the well, older person with cancer, but really that's not who these users you, are. Thank you, Catherine. We'll be back in just a few minutes for our last segment. Uh, please stay with us. Will do. Welcome back to Carol Confidential. This is Kathy Fuller sitting in for Robin Frazier and Richard Rothschild. If you'd like to join us, our number is 410-848-9191. I'm speaking today with Catherine Adelaide uh, from the Tawnytown area who's concerned about uh, medical marijuana being supported by the Tawnytown uh, uh three of the town, Tawny Town Council, and I believe the mayor, and uh, so Catherine's here speaking with me today, and I appreciate your being here talking about this, Catherine. I want to mention that this is a concern in Eldersburg as well, uh, since Senator Reedy has, uh, has um, signed a letter in support of uh, a business coming in to distribute medical marijuana in the, Lon- the old London Fog building right behind the Home Depot in Eldersburg. So uh, I appreciate you talking about that. That initially this. took us off too. Uh, a constituent, I believe, out of. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? It's a little hard to hear you. That was that. Uh, the Justin Reedy letter was actually what tipped um, tipped us off about it about the possibility. We didn't get the Tony Town letter until much later. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a citizen in New Windsor, a friend of mine from church, mm-hmm. and she was dialoguing back and forth and uncovered that letter, which was. You know, put, kind of put people began to get right. people's radar up. Right. So now it's, it's a thing. it it is the law in the state, and you know, and that's what our legislature decided. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these places need to be uh, situated here in Carroll County. If there are places like Montgomery County or Howard County or Baltimore County that they really support that kind of thing, then those distribution and growing facilities should be situated in their county. But I think it runs very counter to uh, what the values and the, and the mores are of the people in our county. And, uh, and that should have been taken into account by these uh, elected officials before supporting things that they know that the majority of their constituents do not support. Well, and part of the deception, though, Kathy, was in, and they've expressed this over and over again. It's like the state makes a bad law, an illegal law. It's a, it's a, it violates the federal law, and suddenly everybody has to be a bunch of sheep and say, "Well, we have to invite it into our town." No, we sure. do not. Yeah. Hitler did everything legal. It was all legal before he murdered 14 million people, and everybody went along with it. So I'm just like, that's the part that's stunning to me is the lack of discernment. Um, you know, they said it again last night. If citizens get up. Well, they, they said it's legal. I'm like, just because something so they make suicide legal, you're going to go kill yourself? I mean, it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. It's like push back a little bit. Well, we and, and there would be, you know, a lot of listeners will say, well, the states have the right to make uh, laws uh, uh, governing these things because it's really not the federal government's purview to do. But the fact is that it is federally illegal. And just because the current administration decides not to enforce that law does not necessarily mean that future administrations won't decide to enforce those laws. And then that will be uh, quite a large battle. And, And on top of that, This is a state that has quite a lot of federal um, employees, and federal employees cannot participate in um, drug activity. And if they do, they don't get to keep their jobs. So if you're in the military or if you're a federal employee or you're a contractor for a federal employee and and, uh, you think that, that being in Maryland will protect you, if you uh, are a medical marijuana user, um, I think you will find that uh, if that's discovered, you will not have your job very long. So there are uh, wider ranging concerns here, um, you know, even with employment. And uh, the fact is that our, our government is not supposed to promote things uh, that are um, socially um, 
that cause problems in society. And I have, uh, I have a statistic here uh, from a study done in 2011 that says among youth, 12 to 17, marijuana use rates in states with medical marijuana laws is 8.6% compared to 6.9% in states without such laws. So about 2% higher youth are using in states like uh, Maryland and Colorado, who both have, well, you know. And I see it as a leadership issue also. Our our leaders should not be, con- uh, you know, endorsing this. That's the part we're trying to get through them. It's like, right. uh, especially, it's not just a state law that doesn't violate the federal law. I mean, that's usually the case. The state law doesn't normally violate the federal law. Right. So there is a thing in the Constitution called the Supremacy Clause, which says when there's a conflict, between the state law and the federal law, the federal law can supersede it. And we're trying to get our jurisdiction to um, just pass a resolution that says if it's not FDA approved, you can't bring it into Tawny Town. Um, we haven't uh, been able to achieve that yet, but that's one of our No Cannabis and Carol. I would like to just give a quick plug sure. for uh, No Cannabis and Carol. Email us at No Cannabis, C A N N A B I S. In Carol, C A R R O L at Yahoo dot com. Think cannabis Carol, no cannabis in Carol at Yahoo dot com. It's an easy email. Email us and so that we can get the information to you. So Great. Great. I'm happy to hear that. I have um uh, I have another uh, statistic here. I'm I am from Colorado and Colorado recently went with full uh legalization of marijuana and um from the Colorado Department of Transportation, from your uh, very good um, uh, PowerPoint uh, that I have a copy of, it says, uh, fatal motor vehicle crashes after medical marijuana. Over 135 people were killed in three years in Colorado when the driver tested positive for marijuana. And oh. it, I mean, it, it just shows that driving accidents went up a lot um, when medical marijuana came in, and that was before even they legalized it altogether. So uh, the fatalities uh, went from 21 to 58, apparently in that uh, in that period of of uh, well, no, actually it says over 135 in three years. So um, it also Thank says you. that the marijuana. Uh, use of marijuana doubles the risk of a motor vehicle crash, and that. Uh, and, and can you believe our state legislature tried to put in a bill to allow smoking pot in cars and public places, which was vetoed by the governor, uh, former Commissioner Robin and I, Fraser and I, uh, from No Cannabis and Carol, met with um, uh, Sh- Sheriff DeWeese and uh, Chief uh, State's Attorney Brian D. Leonardo, and, you know, um, the, the the governor vetoed this bill, and they're afraid it's going to get overridden. So, Is that right? Um, now, was that Governor Hogan, or was that uh, Governor O'Malley that vetoed it? Governor Hogan. Uh, well, good. Good for Governor Hogan. That's a uh, one thing. to I... allow smoking, if yeah. pot smoking, in cars and public places. Is that right? I mean, you, it's, no. you know, it's a thing, uh, you know, it's like all this stuff we have about the smoking, nobody seems to be worried about the marijuana smoke, which is even more deadly. Well, it's quite, quite an interesting double standard where um, tobacco smoking uh, tobacco smoking has become so demonized, and really the only effects that it has, it doesn't, it doesn't alter anybody's realities. It only can impact your own health, and that's only in some people, um, but that has so been demonized that you cannot smoke in most public places. You can't smoke in your car in many public places. You can't, and in fact, uh, in some areas, you can't even smoke in your own house if you're in an apartment, and they can, and they can uh, tell that you're smoking in the apartment next door. So, or if you have small strange. children who are get respiratory illness from your secondhand smoke. Right, right, right. So it's kind of strange that we're promoting the use of smoking marijuana while we are denigrating the use of smoking regular tobacco. Um, and we're promoting the odd. smoking and calling it medicinal. That's medicinal. the real sham. Right. We are promoting this is all about smoking pot. 
joints, and we're calling it medicine. It is not a medicine. Well, it is drug use. And, uh, and as Congressman Harris pointed out, the end game is full legalization, and that's what's happened in Colorado. They went from having it illegal to having it medical marijuana to having it uh, decriminalized to having it legal. Right, they decriminalize and, and, the paraphernalia, mm-hmm. and that's where you get your full-blown head shops with the paraphernalia, the leaves. It's no, you know, it's just no different. And and everybody needs to, we need to be calling our state legislator, our city council, if you buy into this, you're, you're a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. You are, a, and you're the worst kind of drug dealer imaginable, Kathy, because you are violating the public interest Right. It's known with these. What kind of big profits do you think drive an industry that can skirt the FDA process? And remember, well, they didn't I'll, skirt it. I'll tell you, I I know somebody who was trying to get just a cream, just a hand cream through the FDA, and it cost them a million dollars per trial. And so, if you don't have to go through the FDA and you can still call it a medicine, that that's pretty incredible. And we already, they already have, they have everything they need for the few, as Annie Harris said, maybe 12 people in the state of Maryland really, truly need me- true medical, FDA-approved marijuana, uh, uh, can- cannabinoids, uh, the synthetic uh, uh, cannabis, and they can get that. So nobody's missing out here who truly needs it, but the, to use, it's just... It's so deceitful to use the true stories to cover pot smoking marijuana that was being called medical marijuana. And that's and what people what, so confused. And if what a Congressman Harris is correct, and I have no reason to think it's not, that this woman that he was um, citing that's done all the studies that says that it, it you know, it really doesn't do the things that people say it does because the studies do not show that 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 is actually what's happening. People it gets them know, high. That's that's what it, it does. It, it sounds gets them like, high. It, it makes like urban legend. Feel better. It makes their symptoms feel better for a little while. What's concerning me, too, is that this new medical marijuana is being touted as the new magic, well, we can't call it a pill because that's not what it is, but it's just a (laughs) cure-all because it started out. Now they're adding PTSD from the, the, uh, you know, the troops that are coming back, Mm -hmm. and then they're adding fibromyalgia to it. Next it will be migraine headaches, a stub toe, but really it's like, well, any illegal drug always makes those things feel better. That's anecdotal Mm -hmm. evidence. That's not hard science. And what I really realize is you got to keep in mind everything we're talking about is mainly about the smoking of pot, the smoking of joints, and they're calling it medical. Now they get a, they do a little oil, or they do it, and they can put it in the food. And I'm like, really? And when in my day they called it magic brownies, I never tried it, but it's like you heard about it, and they're having overdoses because they're eating too much of it. Yeah, I mean, and there they, are they there are not- a lot of dangers to this yes. that we well, they, that we. The we don't know enough about. We don't. We know that it does alter um, the the growth of the brains of younger kids up until early twenties, because that's been uh, shown in the studies that that I, that I have heard about. Um, and uh, much of this is coming out of Colorado, because they now have. You know, it's been in effect. I don't know, maybe almost two years now. Um, and uh, so now they are getting more and more data, and I think that it it behooves us to look at what's happening in other states before we embrace this because what we find, the realities of these things are often quite different than what we imagine that they will be. And our our government, um, by, as Andy had said, creating the illusion that, um, you know, that this is a medicinal thing changes people's thoughts. It changes our teenagers' thoughts about it. It changes parental thoughts about it. It, it, it gives us a false reassurance. And I've had people say to me that, you know, you, this is a naturally grown substance. Well, 
You know what? Um, there are a lot of naturally grown substances that are dangerous and that, I mean, we, fertilizer we control because it's dangerous. It's not naturally so are, grown, but it's naturally so are, produced. So are, so are poppies, but we can't, we can't bring in boatloads of poppies and That's start exactly smoking it either. Right. That's exactly right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Catherine. I appreciate it. Welcome. And uh, that uh, no, no Cannabis and Carol, was that? Yes, and email us at nocannabisandcarol at yahoo.com. And everybody have a good <laughs>